Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. I'm actually in Carbondale, Colorado uh, for the summer and I'm um, kind of in a rain delay right now. Woke up this morning, was planning to do some fishing uh, and it's raining here. So I'm going to uh, give it an hour or so to let it uh, kind of calm down. And it's actually a great day to go out and throw streamers and uh, try and catch some, some nice brown trout on streamers. So I'm um, looking forward to that, but I had a couple questions that had come in on the Bighorn Sheep uh, podcast that Brian Rimza and I had done, and uh, one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to break down uh, per unit uh, the first choice applicants because I think it's important when you're going to apply, you know, do you have a 1 in 50, you know, do you have a 1 in 80, do you have a 1 in 200, do you have a 1 in 500, like, you know, what are the odds or what are the chances that, that you draw a tag? Um, obviously, we talked about uh, you're either in the max pool or you're not, and about 20 tags go to those with the max bonus points. So if you're sitting in that maximum point pool, um, you really are in the driver's seat. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, you know, there's a bunch of people out there that are getting to a certain age where they're saying, you know, I just want to hunt and they go ahead and put in for some of these, um, kind of lesser quality, lesser trophy known units and they automatically draw. And, uh, so, you know, 20, uh, 20 people, sometimes it's 21, but 20 people, um, from year to year come out of that max point pool. And I want to say there was, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it was 84 or 88 people with max bonus points. Um, so if you do the math, you know, four, you know, a little bit over four years, all of those people in that max point pool, which it is 28. I want to clarify, um, got a couple people applying, uh, that I know that have 28 points. So, um, if you listen to the prior podcast, uh, 28 points is the max uh, point number. Uh, but uh, to my point, um, if you're not in that max point pool, you kind of have to play the odds. And, you know, there's a big difference between a 1 in 50 chance and a 1 in 100 chance. Uh, so I went through uh, with the uh, information from the Arizona Game and Fish and was able to break down every unit. So I first want to go over the one tag units. Now these are one tag units, obviously are for residents only. Um, you can actually, as a, a non-resident, apply for these, but you don't even have a chance because there has to be two tags or more um, for a non-resident to have a chance. So don't waste your pick uh, if you're non-resident. Uh, but I just want to go through this list, and if you want, I can also email you uh, this. So if if you want a copy of this list, just send me an email at jscottoutdoors at gmail dot com, as as well as any other questions you might have about the draw. But I thought this might help you uh, break it down in a list format. So thirteen B South is a one in thirty eight chance. 15 C South is a 1 in 45 chance. And I'm I'm doing these in order of um, easiest odds or easiest to draw to hardest. So 13 B South is a 1 in 38. 15 C South is a 1 in 45. 16 B is a 1 in 64. 16 A South and 18 B is a 1 in 69. 39 East is a 1 in 70. 12A uh, is a 1 in 70. 13A is a 1 in 84. 15C North is a 1 in 88. 15B West is a 1 in 96. 9 in 10 is a 1 in 113. 43A is a 1 in 139. 42 and 44A is a 1 in 150. 37B is a 1 in 180. 24B North is a 1 in 203. 24B South is a 1 in 210. And 24B uh, Wilderness is a 1 in 236. Now, if I go over and 
uh, look at the two tags or more. Now this uh, this category, two tags and more, these units are all available for um, non-residents and residents. So, but the this category, non-residents, this is your only category to draw from. So going from the best draw odds or, you know, the, the lowest number of applicants, um, you know, moving all the way down the list, I'm going to go in order. So there's two tags in 44A East, and it's a one in 28 and a half. Now, one thing to make clear is this is going off of last year's applicants. And every year, you know, things flip-flop a little bit. People see a little bit of, you know, glimmer of hope, and they, you know, pile into a unit. So want to be clear, this is going off of last year's numbers, but it's really the only thing we have to go off of to judge you know, or to predict patterns, uh, f- you know, for the next year. So 44A East, 1 and 28 and a half. Uh, 46A West, there's two permits, a 1 and 32. 45B, there's two permits for a 1 and 36 and a half. 46B East, there's Four permits for a one and 41 shot. 46A East, there's two permits for a one and 45 and a half chance. 40B Mohawk Coppers, there's two tags, 47.5. 16A, there's two tags for a one and 52. 40B Gila's, there's four tags for a 1 in 65. 45A, there's four tags for a 1 in 71. 40B Tanaha Altas, there's two tags for a 75.5 chance. 28, there's two tags for a 1 in 78. 41 East, there's two tags for a 1 in 79 and a half. 46 B West, there's four tags for a 1 in 83. 41 West, there's two tags for a 1 in 84.5. 39 West, there's two tags for a 1 in 85. 45 C, there's two tags for a 1 in 96. 12 B East, there's four tags for a one and fifth, excuse me, one and a hundred and fifteen. Forty A, there's two tags for a one and one forty shot. Forty four B South, there's two tags for a one and one forty six. Thirty seven A is split up into two hunts, uh, but if you just combine them all together with the number of applicants for thirty seven A last year. It's four tags, and there's a one and a hundred and seventy-eight and a half percent chance. Thirteen um, B North, there's three tags. It's a one and two forty-three. Forty-three B, there's five tags, and it's a one and two hundred and sixty-three point five. Forty-four B North, there's three tags. For a 1 in 267.5. 15D, there's 4 tags for a 1 in 281. Now remember 15D, last year there were 6 applicants. But if you divide the number 4 this year into the total number of people that applied, it's a, it's a 1 in 281. 31, 32, there's 3 tags for a 1 in 286. And then 22 South, which is, I think, one of the best hunts in the state. It's a 1-768. Hopefully that helps you. Like I said, if you want a copy of that list, just send me an email at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. I also wanted to go over uh, the... Just, just reiterate the number of max bonus point, uh, or excuse me, the the 2016 max pool tags, which units they win in.
The max point pool tags, last year there was one tag in 13A, one tag in 15C North, two tags in 15D, two tags in 22, one tag in 24B Wilderness, one tag in 24B South, two tags in 37A, one tag in 41 East, one tag in 43A, one tag in 44B North, one tag in 44B South, one tag in 45A. For the Rockies, two tags went to the 6A early, two tags went to the 6A late, one tag went to the 23 and 24A, and one tag went to the 27 South. Uh, there's three tags total. One tag went in the 27 South uh, East. Uh, also, to reiterate, uh, in 2016, there were three Rams shot over 180. Desert Rams shot over 180. There were 18 over 170. There were 24 that scored over um, 168, which is the Boone and Crockett minimum. That's 27.5% of the Rams that were harvested. Desert Rams were Boone and Crockett. Uh, four Ram, four Rocky Rams were over 180, uh, and that's out of 16 tags. So 25% of the Rams harvested were uh, qualified for the Boone and Crockett record book. Guys, I hope that helps you out. If you have any questions at all about the draw, uh, about the the uh, sheep draw in Arizona, uh, please send me an email. I'll be happy to answer uh, as best I as best I can. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I will try and research it and uh, figure it out for you. I appreciate your support of this podcast. I also su- appreciate the support of my sponsors, GoHunt.com, Insider, uh, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, Phonescope.com, and The Outdoorsman's. And you can check the show notes uh, for um, any of the promo codes using the J. Scott promo code, any of the discounts with these companies. I uh, also want to remind you that the Kuyu World Tour right now uh, is set for, right now they're in uh, Medford, Oregon. Uh, they are on their way right now. Uh, they'll be setting up June 1st in Portland, Oregon, June 1st through the 3rd. Uh, Seattle, Washington, June 8th through the 10th. Spokane, Washington, June 15th through the 17th. Missoula, Montana, June 22nd through the 24th. Uh, you can go to Kuyu.com and see the 26 cities that uh, they're going to be going to. And the Kuyu, Kuyu Mobile Showroom uh, is going to uh, be going all over and hitting a bunch of different cities. And you can actually go and try on the gear. Uh, you can actually go touch it, feel it, um, try on the boots, try on the packs, You know, figure out what sizes. Um, I've already heard some great feedback from the guys up in Medford, Oregon. Uh, where the uh, showroom is right now. So, uh, guys, uh, thanks for your support. You can follow me on Instagram at jscottoutdoors. Uh, Also, I just uploaded a bunch of Gould's Turkey videos to my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, That's uh, jscottoutdoors on YouTube. Uh, I just did the part one and two of of three parts uh, of the highlights of Gould's Turkey. And you can uh, go on my YouTube channel or go to gouldsturkeyhunt.com to check those out. Thanks for your support. Guys, a question comes in here from Ryan. He says, Jay, I've drawn some good tags this year. I drew a Colorado goat tag. Uh, I'm going to bite the bullet and purchase a Swarovski 65mm spotter. Uh, And there's more options than I thought. What's your go-to favorite 65mm combination? Thanks and keep up the good work. Uh, Ryan, I would say if you're um, looking for something for that goat hunt, uh, you're probably going to want to go with the 65 millimeter. Um, I would go with the 65 millimeter uh, objective, and I would probably go with the 30 to 70 power eyepiece uh, on that uh, Swarovski. Uh, I like the STX, which is the straight. Um, that's what I would go with. Um, you also ask, how would the BTX be? Well, the BTX eyepiece, I think, would be phenomenal. But if you are going on a goat hunt and you're, you know, you're trying to save weight, um, you know, possibly just going with the straight spotter 
uh, rather than the BTXI piece um, might be the way you go. I think if you're looking for more all-around uh, use, uh, the BTX is obviously awesome. Uh, with that 65 millimeter objective, you're going to be able to use the BTX on 30 power. It's a 30 power fixed. Uh, and I've been uh, using it quite a bit since I got back from my Gould's turkey hunt up here in Colorado and just been out using it, um, looking at deer and, and the bucks are, you know, just starting to grow. Um, but trying to get, get the, a feel for um, the BTX and, and how good it really is. And every day that I use it, uh, I like it more and more. It's real comfortable to use. Um, I've got the 65 millimeter uh objective and I've got the 95 millimeter objective. Um, but I think if you're asking me for, you know, just a straight spotting scope question, uh, I would definitely, uh, probably go with the 30 to 70 eyepiece. Uh, now I also have the, uh, uh, twin spotters. They are, uh, two 65 millimeter STS. Uh, with the 25 to 50 wide angle eyepiece, uh, which is a really nice and comfortable eyepiece as well. Um, but I think if you were just going to get one eyepiece, uh, I'd have to say that 70 power is is hard to beat. So I would definitely go with the 30 uh, by 70 power eyepiece from Swarovski. I hope that helps and hope you have a great hunt. Got another question from Ron. It says, Jay, uh, first, I love the podcast. I've learned a lot in the last few months since I discovered your podcast, and I've been devouring a ton of information. Myself and a buddy of mine are planning a hunting, uh, let's see, are planning a hunting trip for coos deer in Arizona during the December 15th to 31st archery hunt. Uh, we live in Washington, and we already have our license and tags, so we're ready to go. Right now, we're planning on hunting the Tucson area in 33s, 34s, 35s, 36s. I've read a lot about Unit 33, so I imagine it's it's uh, pretty popular. Um, do you have any uh, specific areas you'd recommend we start with considering that we cannot scout on foot prior to the hunt? Uh, maybe even specific roads leading into areas. Uh, not looking for any ho honey holes, just starting points. Uh, we'd like to have a base camp and be able to uh, travel from there. Uh, here's a question. How bad are the snakes, scorpions, and such this time of year? Um, Ron, the snakes are pretty much not a, a non-issue. Maybe every once in a while, if, if it was really warm, uh, potentially there might be a snake out, but very, very rare uh, to find or have any snake trouble in December. Scorpions, ah, uh, Scorpions, probably not an issue. Um, I mean, I've slept out many a nights just, just right on the ground. Um, it is something I always think about because I do see scorpions. Um, but, you know, that time of year, it, it, scorpion, it's not something that, that I'd really worry about, uh, to be honest. Um, you know, you could take a, a you know, a backpacking tent, an ultralight tent that's, you know, all enclosed so you don't have stuff crawling in your sleeping bag. Um, you know, that, that definitely is something to think about there. Uh, also, he says, we both uh, recently purchased 15 power binos with tripods, uh, mainly because of listening to your podcast. Uh, I plan on putting these to work. Uh I plan on putting these to work. He looks like he's got some uh, other hunts in Washington. Uh, yeah, 15 power binoculars for glassing coos deer. In my mind, it's it's paramount. It's 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 absolutely essential. Uh, 15 power binoculars uh, allow you to look further distances. Allow you to look uh, with you know greater detail. You can pick up movement. You can see that black nose of a coos deer bedded. You could see you know, an ear flick, um, 15s, you're going to pick up a lot more bedded deer. Uh, you're going to be able to look into, uh, those, uh, hillsides, um, you know, maybe when they're bedded down and, and really slow down and, and try and really get detail oriented and try and, you know, pick, pick them apart and, you know, uh, pick them out of the brush. Uh, 15s are definitely, uh, what you want to use. And to your question about uh, 33s, 34s, 35s, and 36s, 
the answer is yes. I mean, all of those units have coos steer. All of those units, um, you know, have good density. Certainly there's better places than others. Uh, and, you know, some of the mountain ranges, you know, the Santa Rita's in, in the 34A's, um, you know, you've got the Catalinas and the Rincons in the, in the 33s, uh, you know, and then all, all of the, the Wachukas, uh, in, in the 35s and, and, you know, the 36s down there, Baba Kivri Peak and, um, you know, Southern Arizona is just a sportsman's dream because, you know, you've got, um, really good access, uh, you've, you, you know, you you basically have, you know, coos deer from elevations of, you know, say 3000 feet and higher. Um, and you can get some of those grasslands, uh, some of those mule deer where you've got coos deer and mule deer mix, you know, around that, you know, 1500 to 2000, 2500, even up to 3000, the mule deer can kind of mix in and you get those little bit higher elevations. You get those mesquite, yellow grass, oaks. Um, that's where you're going to find your coos deer. I'm going to recommend to you, Ron, that the later you can go, you know, after Christmas, um, the, the better your, uh, chances are of seeing rutting activity. Uh, also beware that all of these units have rifle hunts in them. And, uh, I believe there are a few units that are not open to archery. So just make sure you check the regulations, um, to make sure you're, you know, you're perfectly legal, but certainly say the last four or five days of December, probably going to be your best opportunity, uh, to do archery hunting in December. Now I know a bunch of the units are open in, in, uh, January for archery hunting. And I would urge you that, uh, you know, if, if you can go in January, I think your success is going to be much higher in January due to the fact that there's no rifle hunts uh, during January and it's basically just archery only. And uh, the deer typically are rutting, uh, you know, pretty darn good all the way through the whole month of January. And, and historically, you're going to get a lot more rutting activity in the month of January than even the last two weeks of December. So hope that helps. Um, uh, thanks for supporting the podcast. Here's a message in on my Instagram on direct message on Instagram from shed hunt fish. Uh, thanks for all the great info, Jay. I got my first Tom Turkey today and couldn't have done it without your, the help of, of you and your guests. Thanks so much for the great information. And there's a picture of, uh, of, of him here with, a with the Tom Turkey hanging in a tree. Um, I said, thanks, uh, for sending what state. And he says, Utah and the foothills above Salt Lake city, uh, turkey hunting is so intense. Now I know why you love it so much. Uh, thanks again for the podcast. I'll be a turkey hunter for life. Thanks again. Uh, shed, hunt, and fish. Uh, thank you for uh, the message, and I'm glad you had some success on your turkey hunt. I'm glad you were able to find some value in some of the turkey podcasts that we've done. It's uh, one of those things. Turkey hunting for me is something that I just absolutely love, and uh, I, I shake my head all the time when I hear uh, people, I hear hunting celebrities, I hear certain people, uh, you know, say, oh, why would you want a turkey hunt? Or, you know, they're just a bunch of dumb turkeys. And, you know, for me, um, if they're strutting, if they're gobbling, if they come into my call, uh, it's, it, it makes for an unbelievable hunt. Um, I think it takes some of the machoism out of hunting, which I, I say that lightly, but I, I see a trend going on these days in, uh, you know, kind of the social media thing that there's this macho element to hunting, which, you know, I think anytime you get a bunch, you know, a, a sport that's made up of, you know, 80% guys, uh, or, or more, um, I think you're going to get some of that, you know, not smiling in the trophy photos and acting big, bad and tough and all that. But, um, you know, one thing I think turkey hunting is humbling. I think anybody that has you know, bags on turkey hunting that hasn't tried it. Um, I r highly suggest you guys try it. And um, if you think it's easy, um, it, I can promise you it's not. So uh, that's a little bit of a rant there. But thanks, uh, Shed, Hunt, and Fish uh, for the message. And congrats on the turkey.
Let me see. Tell me about your Gould's turkey hunts in Mexico. Where do the hunters come into? Okay. Uh, the Gould's turkey hunts in Mexico are conducted under my uh, Gould's turkey uh, kind of uh, domain name uh, website. You can go check out the information there. Uh, but to answer your question, the hunters uh, fly, most of the hunters fly into Tucson International Airport. Uh, from there, they rent a car and drive to Douglas, Arizona. Uh, most of the hunters stay at the Best Western Motel there in Douglas. Your guide will pick you up on the departure day the next morning around 8 a.m. And uh, from there, we drive to the ranches. Uh, we hunt mostly in northern Sonora, which most of the ranches are an, are an hour or two south of the international border there in Douglas. And um, we just got back from our 2017 season. Our hunters harvested uh, 50 turkeys, Gould's turkeys, and uh, we had an unbelievable hunt this year. Uh, I've just been loading a bunch of the videos and pictures onto the GouldsTurkeyHunt.com website, uh, also onto my YouTube channel. I uh, also just finished a part one and two of three of the 2017 highlights. I still have to finish part three. I've got some uh, footage coming in from some of our guides, and um, I'm compiling that. But uh, if you want to see what those Gould's turkey hunts are all about, uh, just go to the website. Just watch the videos. And um, I want to thank uh, Dar Colburn, uh, my partner uh, in, in the guiding, and uh, Hunter Haynes and Chris Rowe for their work uh at uh or during the gould's turkey season uh and if you have any questions you can also email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com here's a message from jesse on instagram uh, he says he's driving out from california um, he's got a late muzzleloader bull hunt any tips or advice what to do um if, if I had a late bull hunt, uh, for one, what you're going to find is that those bulls uh, during that time of year are going to pull back into some of that rougher country, some of that steeper country, some of that thicker country. Um, they're going to want to find those areas where they don't have to travel very far uh, from bedding to feed to water. Um, I'm, I'm, if you're not familiar with your unit, I'm obviously going to try and drive as many roads as I can within the unit. Uh, while I'm driving those roads, I'm going to make note of, you know, where there's campsites, uh, where there's pullouts, where it looks like people have been pulling out, um, look for knobs, any places that you can get up in glass, uh, uh, you know, go check some water holes, uh, tr try and figure out where the, um, you know, if there's any running water, if there's any springs, where those canyons are, where the water is, um, you know, those elk are going to want to find those places where they can get water, food, and, and good bedding in thick areas where, um, you know, they're not going to get busted out. A lot of times those are going to be on, you know, north facing, northeast facing, you know, steeper slopes, thicker slopes, you know, a lot of manzanita, uh, a lot of kind of cat claw manzanita, um, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, a steeper terrain, um, thicker, kind of nastier places where, you know, not just, uh, everybody's walking through and bumping them out. Uh, I'm going to be specifically looking for glassing points where I can, um, you know, be on one ridge and be looking across into some of those thicker areas where those bulls are going to spend a lot of time. Uh, and then I'm going to try and talk to as many people as I can that have had the hunt, um, talk to game and fish guys, talk to forest service guys, you know, stop and talk to anybody that's camping. Um, you know, maybe you pick up, uh, information, you can learn something from anybody. And, um, it's glad, I'm glad that you're going out scouting now, uh, trying to make several trips, but just try and be as familiar with the unit and how to get around and how to access, you know, certain parts of, you know, certain bits of country, um, I would certainly look for those areas that are roadless. I would certainly look for those areas where the elk can be, you know, basically undisturbed, uh, you know, the furthest from the roads, um, you know, where there's, where there's not as much traffic. Um, that would be some of the advice that I would give you. And I appreciate uh, the question. Here's a question. I get it uh, quite a bit. I've gotten it uh, 
you know, both by email and by Facebook message and Instagram message. Uh, guys ask me on the BTX, uh, the Swarovski BTX, the new eyepiece, uh, would I go with the 65, the 85, or the 95? Um, Cody Nelson and I have done several podcasts on the Swarovski BTX. I recommend uh, listening to those. But I think it depends on what your what your planned use is. Um, you know, if you're if you're big into the backcountry, um, you know, you like to really cover some ground, and you know, you're going to um, be really hiking a lot of miles. You know, I'd probably go with the 65 millimeter BTX. It comes in at 4.14 pounds, uh, as opposed to the heaviest, which is the 95 millimeter. I think it's uh, somewhere around 6.2 pounds, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm not looking at my notes right now. And then you've got the 85, which is about a half a pound lighter, um, you know, ju- maybe just under six pounds there. Uh, that is still a, a huge improvement from, say, the Koas that I used to have. You know, the Koas alone were, you know, 13, 14 pounds. Uh, the doctors before that that I had, you know, were or uh, 11, 12 pounds. Uh, but I think one of the benefits of the BTX is you can use your regular tripod that you use for, you know, your 10s or your 12s or your 15s. It does not require a big tripod. And the Doctor, uh, you know, 40 super wide angled or the 30 power or the 20 by 50 fix or 20 by 50 variables um, and the Koas, they require those, you know, 10 to 12, 13 pound you know, Bogan tripods or the Cowie May tripods, but in, in other words, bigger, heavier duty tripods. One of the huge benefits of this BTX is you can use your uh, regular tripod that you use with your with your everyday binoculars. Um, I would say that if you're going to be doing tons and tons of, you know, two mile plus, you know, long range looking, I'd probably go with the uh, 85 or 95 objective. Um, if you're going to be, you know, say two miles and in, uh, I think the 65 millimeter uh, BTX is, is is plenty good for the job. Uh, now keep in mind uh, the the uh, 65 millimeter is going to be a 30 power fixed, uh, and the 95 uh, millimeter objective is 35 power fixed. So yes, you get five more power with the uh, 95 as opposed to the 65, uh, but you also get a, quite a bit of weight savings. You know, you get two pounds of weight savings uh, going with the 65 millimeter. Uh, and I found here in Colorado, obviously I'm not hunting yet, but just packing it around. Um, the 65 millimeter uh, BTX is very comfortable to pack around. And um, I've, I have packed a 95 BTX as well, and it's, it's not bad either. Uh, the, the one thing that the BTX gives you is, you, you know, you're not squinting, you're not looking through one eye in a spotting scope. Uh, the only limiting factor is, you know, it's a 30 or a 35 power fixed, whereas, you know, my 95 millimeter um, STX, I can put the 30 to 70 eyepiece and crank it all the way up to 70 power. But the downside of that is I'm only looking through one eye. Um, you know, I'm, I'm eagerly anticipating the, I believe it's the 1.7 magnifier that Swarovski is going to come out with. And I think the 1.7 magnifier placed on the 65 millimeter objective with the BTX eyepiece is going to put it at, you know, a little bit over 50 power uh, fixed. And I think in, you know, relatively good light i think that's going to be a phenomenal uh, tool to be able to look through both eyes uh with you know over 50 power fixed uh through the 65 millimeter objective so uh guys um i've been having fun with this btx if you have any specific questions about the btx uh feel free to uh send me a message through instagram facebook or email me at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com I really appreciate you guys supporting this podcast and um, please keep the questions coming. Uh, It's exciting times. People are finding out all across the West in all these different states what what units we've drawn. And um, Dar and I have got a mountain goat hunt in Alaska coming up and we're uh, training and getting ready for that. And uh, it's just uh, 
uh, great times to be a hunter. Uh, these summer, summer months are for, for training and, um, I do a lot of fishing also in the summer. So good stuff. We're going to be bringing a lot of great information here on the podcast. And I just appreciate you guys support and uh, want to encourage you guys to support the uh, sponsors of this podcast, GoHunt.com, Insider, Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, Phonescope.com, and The Outdoorsman's. Take care, guys.